Right, so what we've just looked at is the, the bonding inside a molecule, so between the atoms, and looked at that being covalent bonding, and it can be non-polar covalent, and the electronegativity difference is less than 0 0.5, or it could be polar covalent, so there's a, a delta plus or a delta minus, or a permanent dipole in the bond, when the electronegativity is 0.5 or greater. Once it gets up to around 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, it could actually be so attracted to one nucleus that it is transferred and becomes an ionic bond. But we look at other properties for that. So assuming that it is still a molecular solid or a molecular substance, then what we need to understand is why it's a solid or why it's a liquid or why it's a gas. Why it conducts electricity or not, that sort of thing. Well, the first thing we have to look at is the fact that they are molecules. So I've drawn some iodine showing the dashed line sort of directing the electron clouds. Well, the electrons are all committed to these nuclei. So there is no positive or negative particle that is free to move. So that's why all of the molecular solids are electrical insulators. They don't have the ability to pass on a charge because they don't have charged mm -hmm. particles in them. What actually holds these together though? Iodine is a solid at room temperature. Even though it's got non-polar bonds, there's no dipole here at all, and electron clouds should repel other electron clouds. So why the heck is iodine a solid? Iodine is quite a cool one, because if I heat it at all, it won't melt. So it'll actually break this bond in completely and turn it into a gas, so it sublimes. It's quite a good one for showing this. Well, iodine itself is what we call a non-polar molecular solid because there is no slightly positive side and slightly negative side. However, at any instant in time, the electrons won't necessarily be distributed evenly. For example, at any moment in this classroom, you guys might be distributed evenly, or you might all be at one side, or there might be more of you on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. And so even though there's the same number of you, same number of electrons, you might not be distributed evenly at any moment that I might want to take a photo. Okay, but other times, for example, when you're sitting at your seats, you're pretty much evenly distributed. So sometimes you're evenly distributed, sometimes you're not. The electrons in a molecule are the same. And the bigger the electron cloud, just like the bigger the classroom, for example, the more likely it is that these electrons are going to be distributed unevenly at any instant in time. So actually, even though this is a non-polar molecule, it has what we call instantaneous dipoles. At any one moment, just one of the electrons might be a little bit further this way than it is this way. So because electrons are negatively charged, I can show that any instant I might have this dipole created. So an instantaneous dipole. What that will do is, if it comes close to a neighbouring molecule, it will then, the negative side will repel the electrons in its electron cloud, inducing a dipole in it. So it will push the electrons this way just a little bit, just a little bit, enough to induce a dipole. And then what that does is it creates an attraction between the slightly negative side of one molecule and the slightly positive side of another. And this is what we call a van der Waals force, or a temporary dipole, temporary dipole force. So any interaction between molecules we call van der Waals. That's our sort of set, and our subsets are the temporary dipoles and the permanents. This is an example of a temporary one. Now the bigger the electron cloud, the bigger the electron cloud, the more likely this is to happen. It's just mass. It's just probability. So with a big electron cloud, you have a bigger chance of there being a temporary dipole form and therefore temporary dipole, temporary dipole forces. So van der Waals being formed. And of course, the more van der Waals forces, then the higher the melting and boiling point. So something like iodine, which has got a very large electron cloud, and we know that it's large molar mass, because molar mass and electron cloud size seem to have a, a close relationship. Something with a large electron cloud like iodine is going to have lots of van der Waals forces between the molecules, and that's why it's a solid. However, van der Waals forces are really, really, really weak. They're easy to overcome. So that's why if I add any heat to this, basically, I'll break all of these really easily. 
and the iodine molecules will now have no forces between them. And that's why it goes from solid immediately to a gas. Chlorine, on the other hand, is a gas. Um, so therefore, it can't form as many van der Waals forces as iodine, and the reason for that is it's got a much smaller electron cloud. So of course, you infer the one in between iodine and chlorine, bromine. What state of matter would we infer that bromine probably is? Liquid, because it's got an in-between electron cloud size. And we find that things like plastics, which are examples of molecular solids, have all well, the solids at room temperature, but they don't take much heat to break up. They're held together by lots and lots of van der Waals forces. There's a bit more to it some plastics, but simplicity, sim uh, simplicity. Simplistically, you've got this very large electron cloud which can create lots of dipole moments. And so those temporary dipoles create lots of forces holding it together as a solid. And of course, a little bit of heat, I can start breaking those and melting or even burning the plastic. On the other side of the coin, we've got the ones that have actually got a permanent dipole. So they actually have a positive side and a negative side. Not as strongly positive and negative as an ionic substance, but they are slightly positive and slightly negative. And one of the easiest examples to show you here is water, which actually has an even stronger bond called a hydrogen bond. And you learn about hydrogen bonds in level three, so I won't go into those today. But if I have hydrogen down to oxygen, down to hydrogen, I have our good old H2O. And what happens here is we've also got some lone pairs of electrons up here. The oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so it creates a dipole in this direction for the intramolecular bonding. So because the electrons are being attracted a bit more to the oxygen, then it creates a permanent dipole in the molecule. So if I look at my electron cloud, it would look something like this where the electron cloud, the electrons are spending more of their time around the oxygen. So I've got a delta minus side to my molecule always. It's always there. And I've got a delta positive side to my molecule. So if this comes near another water molecule, then it's going to attract the delta negative side of it. So delta negative at the top. Delta plus at the bottom. So the delta minus the delta plus will be always attractive. So even though water has got a tiny electron cloud, because it's got a permanent dipole, it immediately makes this van der Waals force in between those molecules. Every time it comes near another water molecule. As I say, there's another sort of bonding, intermolecular bonding in water called hydrogen bonding, but we'll learn about that next year. Okay? That's basically the reason why water expands when it turns to ice, rather than condensing what you'd expect. So what you're going to need to learn to understand polarity, so to see if something's got permanent dipoles or temporary dipoles, is you need to understand about shapes of molecules. You have to understand about lone pairs of electrons and the effect they have on polarity. And you need to understand about the intramolecular bonding polarity like we did in the previous video. So you need to understand electronegativity and shapes. So those are the things you need to learn about this week to have a full understanding about intermolecular forces or intermolecular bonding, or what we call van der Waals forces. All right. Just a quick side note: anything that can form a permanent that has permanent dipole, so has permanent dipole, permanent dipole, van der Waals forces, also can create temporary dipoles as well. So it has it has the ability to do both. But anything that has temporary dipoles only will never have bonding strong enough for permanent dipoles. Okay? So polar molecules have both of these. Non-polar molecules only have these ones here. Stop there.